I'm, 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 so, I'm so sorry. I, I, uh, I, I didn't realize that you guys were there. I, I just love that music. I don't know how you feel about an orchestra or when they're playing, but some of the best music was written to be played by an orchestra. I love it how every single individual instrument plays together and yet plays its part. It's powerful. You need an amazing conductor, but you also need everybody to be willing to play their part and not to play too loud or not to play too soft, but to be involved in the beautiful concert of what is being made. Hey, can I tell you something? You in your youth group have the opportunity to make beautiful music as every single one of you plays your own part. You're all different and that's awesome. You don't have to be exactly alike one another because together you create a beautiful symphony of what God is trying to do right there in your church and in your community and all across the world. Check this out. Despite the great diversity represented in our churches and youth groups, we can have unity with one, with one another. You see, we need to decide. Don't allow diversity to destroy unity. We need to pull together and understand that God is something do, God is doing something bigger than just with me. I need to work together with those around me in harmony. Check this out. In John chapter 17, Jesus is, is in the garden and he's praying. He's praying for the believers. He's praying for the believers of that time, but he's also praying for us as well. He says this. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their words, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, just as power is released when all those instruments work together, power can be released when we as Christians all are united together with one focus. The explosive growth of the first century church was a testimony to their unity. I'm sure you read about in the book of Acts how they sold their belongings and they shared with one another and they, they shared what they had and as one need they gave to another. I, I, I came across this quote, I love it. Unity is not natural or easy. Prejudice and division are serious issues in our world today, just like how it was for the early church. In the time of Jesus, the apostles, which were people who were routinely and permanently categorized by, by Jew or Greek, uh, Gentile, rich, slave, uh, uh, rich, poor, Greek, barbarian, they, they were categorized. Don't we do that today? Women and children were, were looked down on and, and even cast aside. There were divisions there. Guys, there can be divisions in our world. There are divisions in our world, but in our churches, it should not be so with us. It should not be that way. The church had to be taught to behave differently. And so what I want to do is I want to look into the book of James, James chapter two, the first beginning couple of verses and see how this heart of unity can, can tell us how to live so that we are going to choose to. We're going to don't allow diversity to destroy unity. First of all, we see a call for unity, a call for unity in James chapter two, starting in verse one, it says this, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. You see, our faith should not show favoritism. We ought to be accepting of everybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ, and we ought to show love to everybody in the same way that Jesus showed love to everybody. Could you imagine if there was a youth group, and I, I'm, I hope this isn't true in your, your youth group, but could you imagine if, if in the youth group, kids of this school wouldn't interact with kids of this school because they were from different schools and they were rival schools? I mean, how horrible would that be? Or, or, or what about this? What if your whole youth group was from one school and a guest, a stranger said, man, I want to learn more about Jesus. And I've, I've heard great things about this church. And they wandered into your church, but because they weren't from that school, you all treated them differently and ignored them. That, that is not the way that God has called us to live. We should not treat people with favoritism. We shouldn't treat people in different ways because of what they can do for us or what they can't do for us. In, the, in Acts, the apostle Peter says that God is no respecter of persons. Man, Peter learned that because Peter made a lot of mistakes. Peter always spoke and then thought. 
you know what Jesus did? Jesus still loved him. Jesus still accepted him. Jesus still respected him. And, and we need to show that love to everybody as they come in. Now, James then gets into a bad example. It said, it says in verses two to four, it says, four, if there uh, should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in this good place. And you say to the poor man, you, sit, you stand over there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, James is saying favoring the rich shows partiality and reveals evil thoughts. Partiality is evil. This was a problem back in the early church, but guys, this can still be a problem today. We can treat people, like I said before, based on what they can or we treat them differently based on what they can't or won't do for us. That's not showing love. That's not showing unity. And we need to make sure that we, 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 we stand against that. And we make sure we don't allow diversity to destroy unity. So we, we saw a, a bad example. We, we heard the call to unity. Now let's look at a thoughtful question. It says in James chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, it says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? It, it's almost as if uh, the people were thinking that, that the poor people didn't matter or that they mattered less. That is such an ugly and an evil and a wrong thought. Listen, we need to love other people. And, and if you look at the beginning of uh, or, uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47, it talks about how the church was willing to share as others had need. Guys, we need to look for ways to show love to people in need. And sometimes that's people that are poor. Sometimes God has given us, given us resources and things so that we can be the conduit that hands those to other people. God didn't bless you just so you could bless yourself. God blessed us so that we could be a blessing to the world and to reach out to other people. Have we done this in our group? Have we forgotten that God came to us when we were spiritually not just poor, but bankrupt and spiritually in debt? but God showed his love towards us. Aren't you so thankful that God didn't look to you and say, um, unless you're of this class or unless you've done this, then I, I won't love you. No, 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 no. God did not allow diversity to destroy his heart towards you. No, God loves all people. And you and I need to carry that same message and don't allow diversity to destroy unity. Fourth, we see that partiality is condemned in verses eight and nine, it says this. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. James here, check this out. He clarifies. He says, love your neighbor, absolutely. But show partiality? No way, not at all. We cannot make allowances for partiality. We ought to look for ways to connect with people, even people that we're not connected with, even with people that are different. We ought to look for ways to create a heart and a spot of unity and have an opportunity to love other people. So how do we do this? Well, we started this lesson by talking about the call to unity. When we, when we start to establish unity, how do we maintain it? How do we build it and how do we maintain it? Well, we see in Ephesians, it tells us in Ephesians chapter four, verse one, we need to make a choice. It says, I, therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you have been called. Paul says, hey, listen, you were called to something, now go do it. Can I tell you, you were called to unity, so go live in it. Will you choose to live according to your calling? Will you choose to live out how God has called you to live? Why? Because unity, it's an action, but it's a choice. And sometimes it's a hard choice and you got to work at it. Number two, we got to not only make a choice, but we got to choose to work together. In Ephesians chapter four, later on, verses 11 through 13, it says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as this, some as this. Listen, all of us have different gifts, but we work together to create the beautiful orchestra or symphony of what God is trying to create. So you say, well, those people are different than me. Awesome, you need them, and guess what? They need you. We need to work and use our spiritual gifts 
to proclaim the gospel and to build unity with one another. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, till all come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We need to put others first. Guys, we need to say, I'm going to look out for you before I look out for me. We need to be kind to other people. And lastly, we need to have a common goal. The common goal that we should live for is to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ. You know how you proclaim the love of Jesus Christ? You have united hearts. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be arguments. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, uh, frustrations and problems. That's a part of life. But in the midst of those, we need to prefer one another. We need to be kind to one another. We need to have a common goal. People ought to be coming and banging down your doors because you treat one another differently. So, Will you and I make this decision to act in a unified manner despite whether we get along with somebody else? In fact, if we don't get along with them, we ought to say, man, what is that problem and how can we overcome it? When, when, when people come in, do they take notice of your unity and your love for one another? Guys, we are all different and that's awesome. Think of a puzzle piece. If all of those pieces were the same exact one, they couldn't really come together and to create the beautiful picture. But every single one of those pieces is different and uniquely designed to fulfill its part. So can I challenge you? This week, maybe go to your youth pastor and say, hey, I want to find my piece here in this youth group to create the beautiful picture. Or thinking back to like we said with the orchestra, I want to know my part that I play and I don't want to play it louder so that I must distract a distraction or so quiet that nobody notices, but I want to play in harmony and in unity with the rest of the team so that we can be a beautiful symphony for Christ. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.